On March 24, 1980, Samuel L. Blumenfeld addressed the Eastern Massachusetts Chapter of Americans for Constitutional Action in Newton, commonly called ACA for short. His subject was, Is Public Education Necessary? He is the author of five books, including How to Start Your Own Private School and Why You Need One, The New Illiterates, and the soon-to-be-published Is Public Education Necessary? A native of New York, he has lived in Boston for the past 15 years, where, in addition to his other activities, he is active in the private school movement, serving as a director of South Boston Heights Academy. From 1972 to 79, he was Massachusetts chairman of the Reading Reform Foundation. Mr. Blumenfeld had addressed the ACA meeting in Newton four years previous on the subject, Why America Still Has a Reading Problem. The moderator of the ACA chapter is Arnold Garrison, a descendant of William Lloyd Garrison, the famous abolitionist of the 19th century. Samuel Blumenfeld was introduced by Laura Evans of Weymouth. Ladies and gentlemen, public education in Massachusetts and nationally is a disaster. We are not getting our money's worth. We're not getting returned value for the taxes that we are paying. Ever since Woodrow Wilson was in office, the trend in education has been increasingly toward a more socialistic society. Our schools are being overburdened with programs mandated by government at all levels to include more and more humanistic social programs and much less of the three R's. The purpose of education for a free self-governing society is a gateway to living life with a rich, literate background. Children normally from infancy have an instinctive curiosity and desire to learn. They explore everything. They need understanding and guidance. They are dynamos of energy, active and experimenting at all times. Eventually, into this little bundle of energy that pulls everything apart and everything else, public schooling comes into their lives. And these systems are increasingly failing. For 12 long years, the parents wait and hope that their child will come out at least able to learn how to read and think a little bit intelligently on graduation, and not just to have served a routine sentence required by state law and pay for out of your dollar. Only too often, this is not the case. Only too often, this is not the case as permissiveness, licentiousness, and indoctrinated humanism has come into this child's life. The public schools year has become a race, a race with disaster that we can only win by using our heads, not our feet, and focus our energies to change what they are doing here with your dollar. Same as Sam is trying to change this tax situation. Same as Maxine is trying to hold this family definition. Our standards and values of living in social and economic affairs that are disappearing today depend on a solid, basic education. Our public school systems have in general failed as thousands of school children are turned out into life mentally and socially mangled. And they wonder why we have problems. My sympathies are with the kids. ACA tonight is proud to once again present to you this outstanding address by our friend and yours, Sam Blumenfeld, a dedicated scholar, an educator, an author, a teacher, to whom we could honestly erect a monument inscribed from the children. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, very much. It was a beautiful introduction. And I, I do want to thank Arnold Garrison. First of all, I must say that Arnold has done a, an incredible job. I don't know if he's been running this for 15 years, but he's been no. running it for as long as I've, I've known about. About this. 11. Uh, and about 11, and he's, he's all right. <laughs> and he's done a. What's a the FBI? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, and and, uh, and if it wasn't for Arnold, I'd uh, yeah. <laughs> and if there, and if it wasn't for Arnold, that probably we wouldn't even have this forum because you know there are very few places where conservative uh, voices can be heard, and yet every month here there's a place that we can come to and and sort of get refreshed. So I want to thank Arnold very much we for this opportunity. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, the subject tonight uh, is, is public education necessary? All of us assume that uh, public schools are as American as apple pie and motherhood and that they've always been uh, that way and that uh, our country without public education would somehow not be able to exist. But um, I, was doing, I, I was going to write a book about five years ago on public education in general. It was going to be a critique, an overall critique about the system and why it doesn't work. And I'd, I'd suspected for quite some time that there must have been something about its origins which are, must be a little peculiar to have produced such a, a monster. So I thought that perhaps I'd better do a little research and find out about how it all started so that I'd be able to perhaps find the seeds of what's happening today in the very uh, uh, past itself. And uh, so I started to look into the business of the origins of the public schools, and I went through all the traditional books and found that they did not answer the question that was uppermost in my mind. The question I had was, why did Americans adopt public education when they had complete educational freedom why did they do it? And none of the history books could tell me why. All they did was say that it happened, but none of them said could uh, identify why it happened. You might think, well, maybe because people were illiterate, you know, they, uh, that they weren't being taught, but that's not so. This country was the most literate country in the world uh, at the time of the American Revolution and for the 50 years after that. Um, was it because there were the poor couldn't afford uh, private uh, education? That wasn't so either, because there were more charity schools and there were poor kids to go around. No one in this country had to go without an education if he didn't have any money. In Pennsylvania, as a matter of fact, uh, there was a law, a state law, uh, that said that any child whose parents couldn't afford to pay for the tuition, the state would pay the tuition. So there's no problem about paying the tuition of poor children. So this, 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 uh, the, the whole notion of public education, I was very curious about it, and I, and I began to delve into it. And believe it or not, it took me four years before I could finally put the story together and find out how it happened. And you'd be surprised at uh, how it really happened. There are things that, <laughs> that I didn't even suspect that I had no idea could have taken place in those <coughs> days. This history has been so buried and so completely obliterated, and I can see why, because they don't want you to know that it really was never necessary at all. There was no clamor for public education. There were no marches in the streets for public schools. As a matter of fact, it was put over on us. It was put over by a very small, liberal, elite uh, group that wanted public education more for social reasons than for academic reasons. And this is the interesting thing. They wanted it then for social purposes, for the purposes of changing our society through the children. Because up to the uh, time that we had public education in this country, centralized public education, everybody knew how to read. There was no problem. We didn't have a reading problem. There were no such things as functional illiterates in those days. <laughs> Even the worst schools taught children to read well. But uh, you know, don't underestimate the the uh, the zeal of these uh, reformers when they get hold of an idea. Well, let me give you a, a general out outline of how how it all happened. Uh, when the uh, Puritans settled New England. The Calvinists settled New England. They, uh, they uh, were very keen on, on education. As you know, uh, the Protestant Reformation uh, 
the, the, the Protestant Reformation made a break with papal authority. The authority from then on was to be the Bible. And so you had to have a highly literate community for the Bible to be the authority over that, that society. And so high literacy was an absolute requisite of the Puritan society. And when the Puritans settled in, the, in, in New England, that is the, uh, the Calvinists, they were the ones who decided first to have uh, public schools. And uh, this was in the colonial times. And they did this mainly because they wanted to ensure that all the children were highly literate. Harvard <coughs> was started very early uh, in uh, Puritan history, was started only about 20 years after the colony had been settled. And also they, they wanted to prepare children for higher studies, so they decided to uh, enact laws requiring towns to set up schools for the uh, children. Now this was part of the, the Calvinist system, which believed in church discipline, and that was part of the discipline of the community. Now, the entire United States, of course, the entire, uh, all of the colonies were not settled by, by Calvinists. Many of them were Calvinistically oriented, as Presbyterians were uh, Episcopalians, but uh, the uh, Anglicans were not, and they were Quakers in Pennsylvania. In general, the rest of the country, there was no such thing as, as a public school there were sim or common schools. They were simply private schools run by churches or private tutors or proprietors, etc. And so uh, the only place in the, in the uh, country where you had public schools was here in New England. And uh, when, the, uh, when the British Crown uh, revoked the original charter whereby the, uh, whereby the Puritans had settled New England and ran their own affairs, when that charter was revoked in about 1690, um, the school laws more or less became lax, and people began to uh, drift away from the, from the public schools. They were never terribly efficient, and private <coughs> schools began to, uh, to grow in this part of the world. And the private schools were needed because there, there was a great deal of commerce, they were more practical, and uh, there, were, there was less interference from the, uh, the church in these schools. And so by the time you got to the American Revolution, you had in this part of the world, that is uh, New England, Massachusetts, and Connecticut, you had common schools and private schools. You had more private schools than common schools. The common schools was the name for the public school. You had uh, these laws that required the creation of schools, but they could be private schools. They didn't have to be common schools run by the towns. There was a growing trend toward private education, simply because it was, it, it was more efficient. It was more efficient. The rest of the country was all uh, private, except for parts of, uh, of uh, New York State where Calvinists or New Englanders had migrated, and so they sometimes they set up common schools there. After the revolution there was a general trend away from the idea of, of public education altogether, the idea of the government or of the state running the schools, and it looked as if had, had things been left to themselves that this country would have just had uh, private systems of education. There was no uh, attendance was very high. There was no uh, there was no widespread illiteracy simply because this was a basically a Protestant country, and the Protestants were very keen on literacy. That was part of their culture, and uh, they uh, and so everyone learned to read. There was no problem there. Well, how did things suddenly become reversed? Well, what was happening here in New England was a very interesting phenomenon. The Calvinists, Harvard University spawned a liberal faction that was out to, that was a reaction against Calvinism. And you know of it today as, as Unitarianism. Now, Unitarianism was, was considered by the Calvinists as quite a heresy, not merely just a, a variation of Protestantism, but practically quite a departure. And, uh, but the Unitarians, of course, rejected a great deal, uh, the, the whole Bible-centered world of, of Calvinism. They rejected the, uh, uh, the idea that, uh, uh, 
that man is is uh, depraved, innately depraved, etc., and that he cannot be trusted with power. And uh, they thought that uh, they rejected all of these ideas. They were influenced by the Enlightenment, and uh, they thought that they could that man wasn't depraved. All he needed was education, a better education. In other words, the the root of all evil was poverty or ignorance. Those are the two roots of all evil. And as long as you could uh, uh, educate people correctly, then you could uh, get rid of these ills. So they were in favor of maintaining public education, and they were very strong here in the Boston area. And meanwhile in England, at about, about the turn of the century in England, there arose uh, a reformer by the name of Robert Owen, who believed that what was wrong with human nature was that it was uh, corrupted by this capitalist religious society. And his name was Robert Owen. And he's the father of socialism. And at the time was called Owenism. But he was the father of socialism. And he said that you have to take children at a very early age and then you have to get take out all religion from the curriculum. You have to give them a strictly rational scientific approach to everything, get rid of all superstition, and you've got to put them in in, a, in circumstances whereby they help one another and they and they befriend one another, and you'll get rid of this horrible competitive, this competitive superstitious personality which is caused by religion and capitalism, etc. And um, the Unitarians picked up some of the ideas from Owen, and they decided that, well, we've got to have public primary schools in this, in this area. Now, up till then, primary schools had never been uh, public, even in, uh, even in uh, the earliest Calvinist times. The primary schools were called dame schools. As a matter of fact, you couldn't even get into a public school unless you first knew how to read. And where did you learn how to read? In a private dame school. Now they said, let's make the private dame schools public. And the reason why they said that is because we've got to, you know, that too many poor kids are not getting educated. But that wasn't true either because you had, you had charity dame school, or charity schools for the very poorest kids. So that really everyone was being uh, educated. Uh, but they persisted. And so the uh, the t and the towns, instead of now now they, the town adopted public primary schools. They didn't have to. They could have simply passed a law saying, "Well, we'll pay the tuition of any child who can't afford a uh, an education." But they felt that since the primary schools were in the hands of the Calvinists, that the only way you could take the kids away from the parents, away from parental influence away from their values and give them a new set of values as in, as in, this, in these public schools, which, of course, they would control since they, were, they had become the establishment at the time. And so you had this link in, in Boston between Harvard University, which, had been, which was taken over by the Unitarians in 1819, and that's a very important, very important event in understanding why this country became liberal in a sense what is the source of our liberalism. It started at Harvard University, believe it or not. And it started with the Unitarian takeover of Harvard. And that became a kind of Unitarian Vatican. A very powerful, a very powerful, uh, a very powerful seat for the, for the spread of Unitarian doctrines, not only uh, through religious, uh, in religion, through uh, church work, but through education, through, lit uh, through literature, through, uh, through the arts, through the social sciences. Because who wrote our first history books? They were all written by Unitarian <coughs> professors from Harvard. You see, they were the ones who began telling us how America was shaped. And they were all seeing it through their own point of view. And they also, because they, they, they had this Unitarian point of view, they were not only the citadel of liberalism, but they were also the citadel of anti-Calvinism, that is, anti-conservatism, because you couldn't have one without the other. You couldn't be impartial. You see, they were not an impartial, academically impartial institution. 
and they haven't been since then, <laughs> as we all know. Well, anyway, so they took over the, uh, they, 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 they were succeeded in getting the city of Boston to uh, set up public primary schools. That was the first move in the other direction, away from the private. Remember, the United States Constitution made no mention of education at all. It was left entirely up to the people. There's no mention in the Constitution of education at all, even to this day. And yet, forced busing is, is required because they say of something in the Constitution. There's nothing in the Constitution that, that says anything about education. But anyway, the primary schools in Boston were the first step in that direction. And that was, in, uh, that was about 1819 uh, that that took place. Well, then you had a period of about 10 years when nothing happened. In 1826, though, Robert Owen came to this country and decided to set up the first communist colony in the in, uh, first secular atheist communist colony. Remember, there have, there have been religious communist colonies before then, but this was the first secular, uh, atheist, anti-religious communist colony, and it was set up at New Harmony, Indiana. I don't know, it's, it's now a historic site, you can go out and visit it. Well, that experiment, he came over here with, with, his, uh, with several of his sons, that experiment attracted a great deal of attention. It, and it attracted a great many people who wanted to see what utopia would be like, <laughs> the perfect perfect society would be like, because even then there were socialists around, but uh, uh, they didn't call them socialists. The word socialism hadn't even been invented yet. Uh, but communism, the word communist was, was used as early as that. Anyway, they uh, Owen set up his... his uh, New Harmony colony, and it lasted only two years. It was a complete and total failure. And you know what? why it failed and what the reason he gave for its failure? He said that no matter how much you may believe in communism, no matter how much you may believe in living that way of life, if you have been brought up in the capitalist system, you are thoroughly corrupted. You simply cannot adjust. Therefore, we must start with the little children from the very beginning. And we will not have socialism until first we have public schools and we educate the kids so then they can create a socialist society, you see. And so his son left New Harmony. As a matter of fact, they all left. They all spread out. This is the interesting thing. All of these people who were at New Harmony or were sympathized with it returned to their towns to work for what? public education. That was going to be the new, that was, that was the new priority. You had to have public education before you could even get one step forward on the road to socialism. So his son came to New, to new York and he and, and several colleagues started a newspaper called the Free Inquirer, which was about the most radical thing of the time. It was anti-religious, it was, they were all waiting to talk, it was pro-abortion, it was everything, you name it. Everything that you have today, it was there in microcosm. You know, it was there at the very beginning. The very same ideas, very little difference. I read through here at the Boston Public Library, I went through the, all of the editions of their weekly newspaper and I could see what they were doing and all of the, and what they were arguing on. Well, they, they turned away an enormous amount of people because of their anti-religion. This was very much a religious country. The United States was a, was basically a highly religious country. As a matter of fact, the only reason why America was so free was because people were restrained by their religious beliefs. You didn't have all of these laws. You didn't have anti-pornography uh, laws. You didn't need them, you see. People were restrained by their inner convictions. So um, their, big, their big campaign was to get public education started. So this tied in very nicely with what the Unitarians wanted. So there was more or less a melding of the two, of the two groups, the Unitarians and the Owenite Socialists. Now the interesting thing about the Socialists was that because they were so unpopular, the Owenites were so unpopular because of their anti-religious stand, they decided to go underground. 
And here, I, I, I was amazed when I found proof of this. I, I sort of thought to myself, well, did they or didn't they? Did this ever happen? Well, I was going through the works of Orestes Brownson. I don't know if any of you have heard of Orestes Brownson, but he was a, a great uh, religious editor and, and a man of great controversy who started out as a, as a uh, Calvinist, or a Presbyterian, then became a, a Universalist, then an Owenite, then a Unitarian, and then he finally wound up as a Catholic. But in his but in his writings later as a Catholic convert, he wrote about when he was associated with the Owenites, and he said, and I just want to quote what he what he wrote because to me it was, I felt it was one of the great, uh, it was the single great discovery that I'd made in this research, to find out that the socialists had gone underground in this country and had created a network, a, a network of socialist cells in the United States before the word socialism was even invented. That's sort of uh, mind-boggling. And He wrote, he says, but the more immediate work, this was after he joined the Owenites, he said, was to get our system of schools adopted. To this end, it was proposed to organize the whole union secretly, very much on the plan of the Carbonari of Europe. The Carbonari were a secret organization in, in southern Italy, of whom at that time I knew nothing. The members of this secret society were to, were to avail themselves of all the means in their power, each in his own locality, to form public opinion in favor of education by the state at the public expense and to get such men elected to the legislatures as would be likely to favor our purposes. How far the secret organization extended, I do not know, but I do know that a considerable portion of the state of New York was organized, for I was myself one of the agents for organizing it. That's 1829. You know, it's sort of a little surprising. But this puts... Uh, uh, the lie to the notion that public education was wonderful and pure until the socialists took it over sometime in the 1930s. It's not so. They set it up. They were, the, they were the, the major group setting it up from the very beginning because they knew they could never have socialism in first, unless they first had public education. Well, so the, the big noise of uh, the big campaign to get public schools going took place in the around from 1829, that is from 1830 till about 1850. And the man who was most responsible for organizing the teachers of America, the educators, into a into a, a lobby for public education was Josiah Holbrook. And there's no doubt in my mind that jo Josiah Holbrook was a was an Owenite working underground, a covert Owenite. If there's every indication, I've, I've traced the links, and I'm sure that I can someday find irrefutable evidence that he was. Nevertheless, by the time, oh, also at about the same time, at about 1835, uh, or earlier than that, um, a, French, a, a French professor, Victor Cousin, uh, was asked by his government to go to Prussia and write a book or write a study about the Prussian public school system. You see, the Prussians had started centralized public education in 1819. And Robert Owen takes credit for that in his, in his autobiography. He says that the Prussians got the idea from him because he, Owen argued that you could change a society completely by controlling the schools, controlling the teachers and indoctrinating the kids the way you want them to be indoctrinated. And so the Prussians were the first, he says, to adopt that system in Prussia. That is centralized system. Remember, the common schools that we had here, even in the early Calvinist times, were not centralized. The law simply said that a town had to have a school. And you could run that school any way you like. Uh, you, could, you, had top, uh, you had complete control over the curriculum, the books, teachers. There was no centralized board of education. There was no uh, 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 central committee that told you how to run your school. So there was a big leap to go from the common school as it existed at, as, as it existed at that time and to the centralized idea that was Prussian. 
and Owenite at the same time. Well, Victor Cousin wrote this report, which was then known as the Cousin Report, on the Prussian schools, and he just praised it. You know, he said, what a marvelous system. This is the greatest thing that ever came down the pike. And it was brought over to this, this the book was published in this country, and it became the blueprint for what the American system should be. It should follow the Prussian model. And uh, it was pub published in this country by, uh, uh, by the same people who wanted to spread the word. And uh, it was uh, sent to the different state legislatures, etc., to try to get them to uh, get their states to adopt the Prussian system. And they praised the Prussian system and they said, oh, how wonderful it was. And when it was pointed out to them that the Prussian system was run by a despotic government, they said, oh, yes, but, but think of it. If we applied this system to a free people, how wonderful it would be, you know. I mean, they, they were sure that the Prussian system was going to lead to greater freedom in Prussia and that the Prussian children educated under that system would one day overthrow their despotism. You know, an established uh, would really have the kind of society that uh, uh, that we'd all admire. Well, anyway, so that was used. Now, Victor Cousin was greatly influenced by the Prussian philosophers of the time. Another important thing that was taking uh, going on in Russia, I mean, in Germany at the time, was the uh, the, the rise of Hegelian philosophy, the Hegelian status philosophy. Now, Hegel, it's very important to, uh, to know who Hegel was and to understand Hegel if you're going to understand what our world is like today, because basically we live in a world created by Hegel, by the German philosopher Hegel. Hegel is the basis of communism. Uh, it's the basis of modern socialism, of Marxism. It's the basis of secular humanism. It's really the basis of the modern world, of the modern secular kind of world. It's Hegelian philosophy. And what did Hegel say? Hegel simply said that, well, the uh, Bible is all legend, and uh, man is a progressive. He is, he is, you know, we've got to move on from this, this, uh, this uh, terrible legend that keeps man uh, going nowhere. That man is a progressive creature that he's getting better and better all the time and the way he gets better is through something called the dialectic and the dialectic is some process whereby you have a thesis and then an antithesis and, and they sort of bang each other around and you get what is known as a synthesis <laughs> and we're always going toward a new synthesis and this of course became the basis of dialectical materialism now Karl Marx who was German and brought up and uh, went to German universities and was greatly influenced by this, uh, took the dialectic, the Hegelian dialectic, he took Owen socialism, Owenite uh, theory, economics, uh, Owenite uh, atheism, dialectical materialism, and materialism, and he created something called revolutionary communism. The thing is that Owen's communism was not revolutionary. It was voluntary. He said, oh, if everyone would know how wonderful it is, they'd all adopt it. You know, he said, they, you know, you don't need any revolutions. But of course, uh, well, what uh, Marx brought in was the idea that you have to violently overthrow the capitalist system, that it's not going to go away by itself, you know. And uh, so there you had the birth of Marxism at about 1848. But prior to that, the Hegelian philosophy was coming into the United States, and uh, naturally, it got to Harvard first, <laughs> because Harvard was the big. Uh, Harvard was very open to these ideas. Harvard was looking for progress. For the idea of progressive man was very appealing, because they simply could not accept the Calvinist idea that man is eternally depraved, and that the only way he can get out of his his condition is through salvation, etc. They insisted that, yes, man is getting better and better, that there is such a thing as moral progress. And the only way you can create moral progress is through this instrument of public education, because if you tell people that there is such a thing as moral progress, they will progress morally. And so 
you had this Hegelian concept coming into, into uh, American intellects and educators. You had Owenism. You had Unitarianism. And uh, what else did you need, you see? Now, how could you put this over on the people of the United States? Well, at about that time, how could you get the conservatives? How could you bring the conservatives? Remember, these were, all, these were relatively small numbers of people. The Hegelians, the Owenites, the Unitarians, they were a relatively small minority. How could they get the entire nation to accept this? Well, what was also happening in the United States? You had a tremendous Catholic immigration. Tremendous Catholic immigration at the time, and there was great fear among certain Protestants that if we don't set up a system of public schools to, uh, to more or less uh, maintain the cultural, uh, uh, the cultural way of America, that is the Protestant uh, way, uh, view, uh, we'll be swamped. And so they went along with it. But the only people, the only people who really stood up against the, uh, the, uh, the institution of, of, of putting, getting public education on, that is of the state, uh, setting up schools, were the diehard Calvinists. Because the diehard Calvinists realized that once the schools became secular, that all religion would suffer, you see. And they were dead set against the, uh, the Prussian system that the intellectuals, the Unitarians, and the, and the uh, socialists, the Owenites, wanted to set up. But they had to contend with the, uh, with the other Protestant sects who were willing to go along with public education because they thought that they could control it. You see, from the very beginning there was this idea, well, we'll control it, you see. Everybody wants to control it. The socialists knew that eventually they would control the whole thing because, you know, it was, it was made for them. And so, by the time Horace Mann comes on the scene in 1837 to become the first secretary of the first board of education, a lot of work had already been done. Uh, who were urged to get into public schools realized that it was not for them. They were the first to see what would happen to their religion if the, their children remained in the public schools. And so they set up their own parochial system. Which I, which, and I take my hat off to the Catholics for doing that because they were the, they were the, the ones who saw at first what the <coughs> real purpose behind public education was. It was to change American children into little secular humanists, basically. And if you study the whole progress of humanism, where it comes from, it comes from the Unitarian, Owenite philosophy. Unitarianism, Owenism, and Hegelianism all together spell humanism. It's very, it, it, we simply have a more advanced form of it. There was a, this, this tenacious belief that human nature was malleable, and that man was a progressive animal that, or a creature, that he was getting better, that he could be made better and better, that he was, in a sense, getting better and better. Well, I suggest all you have to do is turn on your TV and see how much better man has become, <laughs> you know, in the last 200 years. I mean, that, what do you see on TV? Blood and mayhem, violence, killings, murders. I mean, we have genocide going on in Cambodia, Afghanistan, uh, you know, human, human nature getting any better? I mean, my, my, my uh, uh, diagnosis is that it's getting worse, <laughs> if anything, you know. But these were the forces at work. So the idea that, that, uh, that public education was any good to begin with, I think, is, is, is a myth. It's a myth. Now, I went to public schools, and I went to pub, and and I got a, a fairly decent education. I went to public schools in in uh, in the 30s and 40s in New York, and strangely enough, that was a pretty good period because it was sort of like a a between period when the uh, when real educational quackery hadn't quite taken over, and it was a transition period. But I was one of the last because the kids who came after me 
have had problems, you know, with their reading since then. But you take, for example, this reading business. Oh, yes, I want to say another thing. Part of the whole public education system, part of the plan for centralized education was to have teachers, colleges controlled by the state. Why? Because if you want to change human nature in a certain way, you've got to change, you've got to control the teachers who are going to do the teaching. So you had to have teachers' colleges. And the first state teachers' college, in those days they call them a normal school, was started in Massachusetts, in Lexington, in about 1839, about two years after Horace Mann took over, after the Board of Education was put into place. It was opened in, uh, in uh, Lexington. And wouldn't you know that the first two subjects that were taught to the students there, these young teachers, were the whole word method of teaching reading, which has been the cause of our literary problem, our literacy problem. It started back there, believe it. And phrenology. Now, what was phrenology? Phrenology was the science of human nature. It was the first attempt to take a scientific look at man. You see, up to that point, man was an open and shut case. They just said, well, he's fallen. He is a fallen creature, original sin, etc. And he's got to be watched. As a matter of fact, the American Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, was built on the Calvinist idea that man could not be trusted with power. Not because power corrupts man, but because man corrupts power. You see, that's the original. But the uh, but that's been twisted too. Nowadays they say power corrupts and, power, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's nonsense. It's the other way around. It's man corrupts power. He simply cannot. There are very few men who can handle power. And so the Constitution decided, well, give man as little power as possible, disperse it, because they knew that once you give anybody power, he uses it. And, and I'm, I'm, I firmly believe that. For example, in this United States, we have an, a, an incredible tyranny of the bureaucracy, not because we have one Hitler, but because we've got about 20,000 little Hitlers <laughs> in these various bureaucracies. And if you've ever come, a, come up, up upon one of these little Hitlers, they're just as bad as a big Hitler. <laughs> Within their, yeah, in other words, but they're, they just have a little bit of power, but they're, they're no... They're no different in a sense, you see. Just as ruthless. Just as ruthless within their, uh, within their purview. Well, so you had to have teachers' cause. Oh, phren phrenology. Phrenology was a science of human nature based on uh, what the uh, uh, founders of phrenology thought were bumps on the head. That is, in other words, man was not evil because of his nature, but because of an uneven development in certain parts of his head, because the head was thought, the brain was thought to be the seat of all human, of human personality. So they said, well, if a man is a murderer, it's because that part of his brain that devoted to murder was a little larger than that part devoted to benevolence. And they said, the only way you could solve that was to develop, they figured the brain was sort of like a muscle was to develop, uh, develop the, the benevolent part to offset the malevolent part. And this was, this was taken quite seriously, and, and uh, Horace Mann was a phrenologist. He believed in it uh, very strongly, and, and George Combe, who was more or less the spokesman for phrenology at that time, wrote a book called, called The Constitution of Man, which was read by all of the Harvard intellectuals, and uh, most of them swallowed it, not all of them. There were a great many of them who were a little skeptical. They thought that, well, this was going a little too far. It was not terribly scientific. But it was the prevalent philosophy of the time. And believe it or not, phrenology, as an explanation for human evil, was more or less accepted as the, uh, as the, as the uh, uh, explanation until you get to modern psychology, which came around 1880 with Wundt in Germany. You've got about 50 years, a 50-year period in which people are more or less, more or less believed in phrenology. But as you can see, the, the, the whole idea was you can change the nature of man. You can make man better. That was the reason why 
they needed the teachers' colleges and they needed the uh, the, uh, uh, the public schools. And the teachers' colleges became the seat of all of this educational quackery because they had to keep finding ideas and means of changing the nature of man. And since it's an impossible task, as we know, I mean, God made us the way we are, and he, he sort of bungled it in the Garden of Eden, and I suppose that's, <laughs> that's the way it happened. I mean, I'm just, I would, uh, I, I don't, I think that the, that the, the explanation in Genesis makes much more sense than the phrenologists, or, or Sigmund Freud, or, uh, or anything that this modern psychology has been able to come up with. As a matter of fact, one of the great failures, scientific failures of all time, is the failure of psychology to explain human nature. What's the present state of it is now behavioralism. They say, well, man has no soul. He's just an animal. Treat him like a dog, you know, Pavlov dog. He'll salivate at the right responses. That's, that's what it's come down to now. You know, they finally have reached that. Behavioral psychology is the answer to all of our problems because, frankly, they realize now that man is not this great progressive creature, that morally progressive creature that they thought he was. You see, you can easily get confused because man is progressive in the sense that, you know, you get the 1980 model of Ford and we go on to bigger and better things, higher buildings, better planes, etc. So progress has been made on the material level. But moral progress? None, whatever. I can't see it. I don't think anyone has seen it, and I think everyone admits that it's a, uh, that it isn't there. And so, the seeds of public education's failure were planted then because they were trying to do the impossible. And they were going to use the state in which to do it. Incidentally, the state was, they decided the state was to be the, uh, the vehicle by which man was going to make his progress. Why? Because if man was this great progressive creature, and incidentally, when Hegel rejected the Old and New Testament, he didn't reject religion entirely. He came up with what is known as pantheism. He said that we're all a part of God. We're all, you see, all everything is God, and we are a part of God. Therefore, we are God-like. And so instead of man being innately depraved, they turned it around and said that he's innately perfect. There was such a thing as perfection, human perfection. The idea that man can be made perfect was pushed at that time by these people. So, and the state, they said, well now, well, since man is perfect, or can be perfect, and since he is innately good, uh, give him power. Give him all the power he needs to do good. And the state was to be that vehicle of power. They said, well, now man is reasonable, he's rational, he's discovered science, he knows how to order the world. He is now fit to rule the world. And the only way he can rule the world is through this instrument called the state. And so they uh, brought about this notion that the state is the supreme authority in everyone's life. Not God, but the state. Now that was another departure from the Calvinist view. The Calvinist view was that, of course, that God was the supreme ruler. And that if any king disobeyed God, you didn't obey the king. As a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons why the Americans were so uh, easily <clears throat> uh, rose up against the British crown is because they considered the king as being uh, uh, anti-God or at least a sinner. In other words, he was a sinner like everyone else. There was no such thing as the king being better than anyone else. He was like everyone else. He was also a fallen creature. But, um, so you had the state elevated to this point where everyone owed their allegiance to the state, the state above all. 
And if you notice in Europe, it was more easily to develop this idea of what they called it nationalism. So you had these states engaging in world wars in which they decimated millions of people for Germany or for France, etc. You see, uh, you had people fe feeling like gods being glorified, human beings being glorified above, above God himself because man was the most powerful creature on earth. And so they, they, they created the notion of status. This country has never been status. This country, the people of this country are patriotic. They believe in community. But their idea of the government is that the government should govern best that govern the least and that the government is the servant of the people. Whereas in the statist idea, the state becomes the, the instrument to which all of human destiny uh, works itself out. And of course, the communist state is the epitome of that. The communist state is that. And so now we, we're in a position as to, to think of, well, what can we do with public education? We know it's failures. Can't teach kids to read anymore. Violence. Uh, it's being and it's now being used quite openly as a social instrument, as a tool, just to bring around social change. You've got what is false busing, nothing but a but an edict to uh, to uh, change uh, racial relations through uh, through the school. The school is an instrument of the state, you see, and so it can never do us any good. I think as uh, conservatives. It would be wiser to think in terms of getting rid of public education. It would be a great boon to the taxpayer, first of all, because it it takes from the taxpayer now about eighty billion dollars a year. You have a huge bureaucracy, educational bureaucracies in every state, fifty states. Incidentally, these people way back then were thinking in terms of a national educational system centered in Washington. If they had to contend with, it, with the states. But now, as you can see, the pattern is very clear. We get more and more toward a centralized national system. We have centralized state systems, which are national in a sense, because if you understand how the educational bureaucracy works, the educational establishment works, these top professors at these universities and colleges of education, they're all one big happy family. And they go from state to state. They're not at all restricted by, by any uh, state line. But now you've got your Department of Education, which is what, which is what they wanted all along. They wanted a, a centralized, nationally controlled system with this huge bureaucracy. Well, if we got rid of, of public education, we could get rid of that bureaucracy. We would get rid of state uh, teacher training because these state teacher uh, training institutions are are turning out teachers who are indoctrinating our kids in in secular humanism. Now, secular humanism is a religion, and we're supposed to have a separation of church and state in this country. So how can you have a state religion? Are promulgated in a in a uh, government institution. There's something wrong there. Of course, the secular humanists would deny that it's a religion, but other in other areas they do state it is a religion, and certainly it has religious implications because its tenets are directly in conflict with the teachings of uh, the great religions. So. What do we do with public education? As I say, the only thing we can do with it is to uh, get rid of it. It's not going to get any better. It can't possibly get any better. It's going to get worse. The only alternative is private education, to get education back into private hands. And how do we do that? Well, first of all, it's being done all over the country and slowly at the moment. In the South, it, is, it, it was done extensively after the busing uh, edict. And they have in the South a very successful alternative private systems throughout the South. I discovered that when I did my first book, How to Start Your Own Private School. I went down South to see these private schools for myself. 
And I was amazed that all these schools are beautifully run, low tuition, uh, kids are happy, you know, getting educated, and uh, very few people know about them in America. It's the best kept secret in this country. Hmm. Why? Because, uh, well, the educational establishment doesn't want you to know that it can, that private schools can flourish, that parents can control the schools, that communities can control their own schools, with private boards of directors and private boards of trustees, etc. That it's no great big deal to run a school. Yeah, it does take uh, it does take effort, it does take skill, but it's it's not impossible. Uh, and it's being done. Then, of course, you have the spread of the Christian school movement, and the Christians, are, the Protestants, now are doing what the Catholics did back in the uh, early days. The Catholics found out very early what the purpose of public education was. And they wanted no part of it. Now the Protestants are finding out, that is, the fundamentalists are finding out. And so now they're creating a whole system of, of, uh, of private schools throughout the country, which is a good sign. Here in Boston, uh, after the uh, big turmoil of a couple of years ago, uh, we were able to get three schools started in this city. And I'm proud to say that I'm a member of the board of directors of South Boston Heights Academy, which is one of the private schools that was started about five years ago by parents, by the community itself, and we have found out that it's quite possible to run a very decent school at very modest tuition uh, fees and to eliminate a lot of waste, a lot of garbage uh, by running uh, schools in this way. And uh, uh, the school is, is, is controlled by the citizens who live in the community have their input and are, are most concerned with the children who go to that school. Who would be most concerned? Those people who live in the community, not some distant, uh, distant theorists or educational bureaucrats. As a matter of fact, the busing plan for Boston was put into effect by a professional educational bureaucrat from Florida, the University of Florida. And he knew so much about Boston that he matched Roxbury with South Boston. That's how, you know, that's <laughs> how smart he was, you see. He figured, well, they're close together, you know, put them together. But, of course, that was a recipe for disaster. But that's the kind of thing that's done through the bureaucracy. You get the, the, their charts, they've got their charts, they've got their numbers, they've got their buses, they've got their budgets, and they go ahead and they proceed on that basis. All right. So we have a spreading private school movement in this country. I think the way we can possibly get Americans to realize that public education is, is destroying their children is simply to open their eyes to it and to show them that there are alternatives, that, that you don't have to worry that the poor are going to be unschooled if, they, if you have uh, private schools. There are all kinds of ways of making sure that every poor child gets an education. I mean, you know, there's more philanthropy in this country uh, being shelled out to, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever read the, what the Ford Foundation gives its money to, but they give most of their money, and the Rockefeller Foundation, the Car they give most of their money to people who really don't need it. They give it to professors <coughs> who have good jobs in universities. You know, the money doesn't go to anyone who really needs it. It just goes to those who have it. You know, it gives them a little more. It's for prestige purposes, to do studies. It goes to all these PhDs that do studies. And if you've ever read, read <coughs> the titles of some of these studies, <coughs> you'd realize that the money is being just wasted. But in any case, without public education, without the public being taxed, for the public schools which don't do anything, it's a complete and utter waste. I'd say today, you know, they have that, it says on the, what does it say on the cigarette package that, uh, you know, this is a no, danger no. to your health. Danger to your health. They ought to put a sign on every public school in this country that putting your child in this school is dangerous to his health. And of course it is. It's dangerous to his mental health. And every large high school in this country is a marketplace for drugs. Uh, at least 90% of them are certainly in the center city. There's no question about it. Every large, market, every large school. When I was substituting a teaching in, in Quincy High School, uh, 
when doing research for my first book, kids admitted to me that they were selling and smoking marijuana downstairs in, in, the, in the boys' room, and that was in 1970. That was uh, 10 years ago. So now it's, you know, it's infinitely worse. We, now, we know now that the drug traffic is in the elementary schools. In the elementary schools, you see the little kids are now being put onto the drug traffic. Well, I can assure you that you can't, if, even when kids go to private schools, the kids who go to South Boston Heights mm -hmm. Academy, I'm not going to say that no one in that school has ever smoked marijuana, but I'm saying they certainly don't smoke it in school, you know, because they'd be thrown out on their ear. You know, it's, it's easy to control these things in a private school easier than in a public school because now of course the public schools are completely tied by various courts and court orders of various kinds then they talk about they say well if you if you had all private schools an awful lot of kids would stay away you know they wouldn't go to school but there are in this country at any given time at least a million or two youngsters who don't attend school anyway. They're either thrown out by the public school who can't handle them, or they don't show up anyway. They're truant. So the public sector is not solving that problem either. In other words, the public sector is not solving any of the problems that they say would exist if we had a completely private system. If we were completely private in this country, we would have far better education at lower cost to everyone, and Education would probably be the quietest thing in the country because now public education is an arena for social conflict. That's all it is. It's where everybody wants to control it. Everybody's fighting over it. You have sex education. You've got vandalism. You've got uh, you've got busing. You've got racial integration, racial disintegration. You've got <laughs> the reading problem. <laughs> the, the schools have become nothing but an arena for social conflict and so they're always in the headlines but you know why you don't hear anything about the private schools in the south aside aside from the liberal bias of the press is that there really is nothing to write about the kids are learning they're learning how to read there's no violence no drug traffic there's uh, no problem no vandalism you know no problem so they don't make the six o'clock news <coughs> but public education does because We've turned it into an arena. We've turned it into a battleground. <clears throat> and I submit that education cannot be conducted on a battlefield. And there's no indication that it's going to get any better. So I think that once you understand that, edu that public education was, quote, rotten, unquote, from the start, that is, it was basically, it was based on the wrong premises. It's based on the premise of that man is a progressive cre creature in the, in the moral sense. It was based on the premise that you can change him. It was based on the premise that if you control the teachers and taught the teachers how to change the kids, that it would come about. Well, we see that it hasn't. We've had 150 years of it. It's been a total disaster, a total failure, and uh, there's no reason to continue it. No reason, no good reason, no logical reason, no sane reason. As a matter of fact, Getting rid of public education would be returning to the principles in which this country was established. It would return to the common sense views that the people then had about education, that education was a parental responsibility and that it could best be carried out in a normal, uh, uh, normal marketable way. There's nothing mysterious about education. It's just instruction. Uh, and it does not require this, this mysterious nonsense that the educators try to uh, put over on us. Let me just end with, with one thought. You know, the present, what presently bothers the, the bureaucrats or the professional educators at the moment is this business of minimum competency laws, you see. Suddenly, the the, the legislators are getting tired of, of functional literacy. They're getting tired of high school graduates who can't read, who can't 
fill out applications, and so they're passing these minimum competency laws. And I was reviewing a book the other day written by one of the, the social scientists who had gotten the state of New Jersey to uh, go in for what is known as equity, equity financing, that is all the schools could be have the same amount of money so that a school, say, in Brookline and South Boston, the one in South Boston, should have as much money as the one in Brookline, simply because a school is in a rich town doesn't mean that it should have, uh, uh, that the educational opportunity should be any better. Well, anyway, he was able to get the New Jersey Supreme Court to, to rule on that in favor of, of the doctrine of equity. And now they're up against this doctrine of, of uh, educational, uh, equal educational opportunities, which are now being legislated into the system by the minimum competency law. And in this book he said, he says, well, it was easy to do the first, because that's a political thing. He says, but the second one is far more difficult, he says, because nobody really knows how to teach. <laughs> they really don't know how teaching takes place. I thought to myself, what an incredible failure. Here the government has controlled teacher training in this country now for over a hundred years and they admit now that they don't know how to teach anybody to teach. Now how, how much worse can you get? How much more worthless can you get? You know, talking about being shortchanged. I mean, there's no mystery to teaching kids how to read. I mean, I wrote a book on this subject, The New Illiterates. And I know how it's done. There's no big mystery. It was done before public education ever came out of the scene very nicely. And it was done even in some public schools very nicely, up to a time when the radicals took over. So there's no mystery there. But as I say, all the, tr the idea that these, these high paid professionals can go around talking about this mystery of teaching as if it's some incredible, uh, mysterious process that that requires you know this new open classroom or this or that or some new gimmick is ridiculous they're simply admitting that they have failed and no amount of money that we throw at education is going to change them is going to make it any better so my and my closing statement i simply say that we ought to work to uh, enlarge the private sector <coughs> get people to realize that public education is a dead end and it's never going to uh, uh, do what we expect it to do or what or what we would like it to do it simply cannot do it and there's no reason to throw good money after bad after they've had 150 years in which to prove themselves one way or another thank you very much Thank you very much, Sam. Okay. Um, well, Winston, I just want to say that most of what I said, I, I wrote in an article called Why the Schools Are in Public, and I have some copies back there if anybody wants to buy it. One dollar a piece. Yeah. Just take the zero. Um, <laughs> Blumenthal has uh, said that he would... Blumenthal. Well, yeah. as I uh, said that he would take questions. I'm going to ask the first question. Sure. He didn't uh, mention anything about the voucher system. Would you comment on that? Well, uh, let me see. The voucher system is a, is a good step in the right direction, but it simply means that the government is going to control the money. You see, so you're still collecting taxes. The government is going to control the money, and they're going to set the standards for the schools, the private schools that will be eligible for vouchers. Now. Milton Friedman on, on television said, well, when he was told that wouldn't that uh, mean that the government would eventually control private schools, he said, well, listen, during the GI Bill, we handled things very nicely, you know. We were able to go to a, an accredited school and, uh, and the uh, state, uh, the government paid for it. But I think here we're, we've, we've come a long way since the GI Bill. Remember, the federal government has grown since 1945. And the bureaucracy, the educational bureaucracy, is much more ferocious today than it was in, in 1945. You've got, you've got a, you've got a, you've got a lethal beast there that's on a leash, you know, with the fangs. I mean, that's it's it's dangerous. As I said, you're we're contending with with um, ten thousand little Hitlers all over the place. <laughs> You see what they try to do, private, what the IRS try to do with private schools just uh, mm. recently. 
and it took a tremendous outcry from people to stop that. So I don't favor anything that would give the government, continue the government's role in education. I think we have to push the idea that the government should get out of education entirely. It doesn't belong, it doesn't belong in medicine. We don't need socialized medicine. We don't need socialized education. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. This is simply, I understand, was the last state in the Union to uh, call for compulsory education. Yes. It was the first state in the Union to rescind compulsory education. Uh, I've often wondered, as a result of the hassle in South Boston, that's a mild word, hassle. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but I often wonder why Senator Bulger, who tells a good story, and that's a great one line. Tell it to the next part. I wonder why he and Ray Flynn uh, didn't propose legislation which would have helped in the hustle situation to rescind the compulsory education law in the state of Massachusetts. I filed a bill for the last couple of years to rescind compulsory education in the state of Massachusetts. So did several friends of mine. Yeah. But I didn't see any, what I don't see happening at the conservative level, for example, the libertarians, the stand, you ask them in their final warning, you ask the representatives from South Boston and East Boston, was supposed to be so concerned like the lead they didn't file any of the legislation. Yeah. That would have, in my opinion, would have struck the fear into the into the uh, educational force. It would have opened a crack and from then on up yeah. yeah. Well I think Mr. Morgan would like to Mr. Morgan is, uh, is on the board of directors of South Boston High School uh, uh Heights Academy. He, no, I mean, he just filed okay. I just filed this and he didn't want to do it either. The representatives from South Boston. There are two of them over here, Ray Flynn, who used to be a member, who's now a city councilor here, who is now turned into one of the most ultra liberals of all. I don't know if you people have noticed this, but he has gone 180 degrees, except for the pro-abortion, uh, pro-life. Outside of that, he's gone liberal completely. Tony Bogan has a skeleton in his closet. He can't do too much, I tell you. First of all, Sam, I think when you mentioned that the parochial schools were the first ones, first ones to wake up to the fact that the government was interfering. I don't know how many people in this room were aware that the federal government is now subsidizing the parochial school system. Oh, yeah. That's right. And yeah. this is something that will shock you people. That the little yellow buses in South Boston pick up students in the parochial school and take them to the McCormick, the Dearborn, and another school that's in Rock Street for what they call cultural enrichment. Oh, yeah. uh, and the parents are told that they don't let them take the children out of the school. Yeah. Now, this is only the start. This is in South Boston, so you can see it's spreading throughout the whole yeah. right. archdiocese. Yeah. 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 So if your friend wants some ammunition about Father Dryden, <laughs> I'm just give him the <laughs> is this forced busing? Huh? Is this forced busing? Well, it is isn't forced, but if you don't like it, take the child out of the school. Yeah. It seems yeah. funny the other night I watched Cambridge, and I kind of understand what I'm saying. You were at the meeting. Nobody from the government is going to tell me, tell me where my children are going to school. That seems funny. I heard it six years ago. <laughs> That's true enough. Yeah. Yeah. And if they don't do it, what's going to happen? They'll go to court. And every told to do it. Well, so that's true. There's a Catholic school like by the judiciary, yeah. not by the people who are elected. Yeah, the right. parochial schools well, have, have, uh, have become, become liberalized, <laughs> more or less. They're being, they're being taken over. <laughs> Nobody reads what materials is doing. Oh, yeah. First of all, TV just had a federal grant for low income housing. The chairman of the people in Sichuan with low income housing. He's branching out. Sure. Believe me, this is going to accomplish. Dr. Woods is already advocating, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Metropolitanization. Yeah, that's the next step. Now because the Boston school system is 75% minority. Sure. Right. Extend it out. Well, uh, the thing is to never system. underestimate the, 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 the grab, the power I'm grab right. of the federal <clears throat> educational bureaucracy, no matter how rotten it may be underneath. You know, just as they, what, as, as uh, last, or uh, last month when you had your, your man from the Soviet Union here, he said that nobody believes in communism in Russia. But yet communism is on the march, as far as the armies go. It's the same with the federal bureaucracy. It's on the march because they've got, you know, several 
uh, how many millions of men on the payroll who are doing their work every day in the course of their work, advancing. You see, that's what makes it so powerful. Crane made a, I don't know, I, I think you know, that Phil Crane's book down there at the yeah. uh, South Boston, he's one the only one who went down there. Some of the other more distinguished Boston representatives who went down there. But he pointed out that within the Constitution, this is another thing I charge against Mobley who's down there, and Louise Day Hicks and the rest of them. Under the Constitution, as you know it, I think it's Section 3, Article 2, or one of those gizmos, that the, uh, Congress can restrict the appellate jurisdiction of the United States Supreme Court of one line and just say, hey, you're all done reviewing education, period. Gary got the job, yeah. you know, as far as the rules. But that's the thing that the leadership doesn't provide to the people in the, in the community. Louise Day Hicks never got up and said that. Uh, Mowgli won't get up and say it. And Senator Ted Kennedy's the head of the United States and the Senate Judiciary Committee won't say it. He could turn it around. Yeah, don't expect yeah. it from the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think Sam made a statement. He said the minority of a few people run the country. And it's exactly it what it is. When, when you use the word minority, I'm not talking about black well, people. No, 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 no. Five people can sit in a room. If those five people are dedicated, they can turn the whole thing right around. Yeah. Now, you try to get your neighbors out that feel the same way as you are just to go to a meeting. They won't come out. There's one way you can strike a blow against them. At least you can start. Cut them off at the pass. Don't let them have as much money as they used to have. That's right. Vote for tax limitation <laughs> next week. <laughs> It's very interesting, you know, Sam uh, uh, mentioned how the teachers have been the ones who have been going sure. through this. Yeah, the, uh, they have been the our CLT. biggest enemy. They have harassed us to death, and they have told us in no uncertain terms <coughs> that they consider tax limitation aimed at them. Yeah. Right. Remember, yeah, of course, you must remember that teachers are not freedom fighters. Oh, Every oh, dictatorship mm -hmm. in the world has been able to find teachers to teach their kids. In Castro's Cuba, they have teachers. Hitler's Germany had teachers. Russia has teachers. The teachers do whatever the state wants them to do, and American teachers will be no different. Oh, yeah, yeah. Leading a protest against the draft already. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Laura. Um, to, 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 uh, and this is the same that Robin said to here too. There is in the in the wing and connected with the regional government and the metro government, there are already the outlines somewhere for regional finance committees and breaking up local fiscal economies in the school. So literally, now we have a relationship in the school systems where the local school committees might or might not be run well, but they do have some input into what happens to their children in their cities or towns. But if they get a regional school committee dictated to this whole regional from the state, they're just in deeper. So a lot of the things proposed here about getting the government out or through the vouchers or anything is really going to uh, drift in that direction. Mm -hmm. rather than out. It's got to stop the, I agree with you, it's got to be more of a salt on the system. And I have asked Sam, in this first tax limitation thing they had a paper was, part of it, the petition was to set up this regional finance committee when they took out the local fiscal economy, I tell them separate the two. Yeah. Oh, separate the two. Sure. Don't put the two in on one bill because yeah. you'll get trouble. Gentlemen in back of Sam. How is, how is secular humanism? Uh, Boston the school system now. Well, secular humanism gets into the schools through the curriculum, through the textbooks, yeah. social science. Incidentally, the very word term social science was invented by Robert Owen because that was the science of society. He said it could all be done scientifically and he called it social science. As a matter of fact, he called his Owenism the social system. You see, that was before it became socialism. And social science was the scientific means of changing society, of creating a new environment in society to create little socialists. And it goes way back, it started back, the, the Social Science Association was started its work in England in about the 1850s. 
So it goes back quite a way, and of course nowadays social science has replaced history and geography. And you, you, uh, I do some tutoring on the side, and and I hear what the, the kids tell me what what they're learning. And I've been tutoring one high school graduate who had a reading problem, and I asked him. I said, uh, which war came first, the War of 1812 or the Civil War? And he didn't know. <laughs> It was a high school about the First World War or the Second World War? Yeah. <laughs> that, <came first. laughs> that I think I they can figure out. But I realize that, that American history is taught, American history is taught in such a fragmented, a fragmented way that I decide, well, I'll have to teach this, this young sir American history. And of course, the only way you can teach him is to start from the beginning and just start from the beginning and go. Then he has an idea of what happened when, you know, what happened first. But all of that, you, you have no idea how the curriculum has been destroyed. The traditional curriculum has been destroyed. It is a shambles, a complete shambles. Uh, one youngster I'm tutoring was learning all about uh, Louis Napoleon in France, and he didn't had very little American history, so he knew more about Louis Napoleon than he did about George Washington. They don't. That's right. They don't know up from down, east from west, north from south. Communism, my God, they don't even, they can't start to know. Why do these athletes want to go to Moscow? They have the faintest idea what communism is about, you know. If they had just a little inkling of the monstrosity that communism is, of the horror and brutality of it, they wouldn't want to go near there without Carter telling them, you know. That's the, that's the horror, that the education in this country is, 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 is so feeble, so awful, Checking the hang in there. Yeah. The conservative tide has just started. Oh, yeah. It's just starting. We're only 25,000 years out of the cave. <laughs> Give us a chance. Do <laughs> 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 you believe in moral progress? Getting <laughs> <laughs> yeah, better? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you want to com would comment on uh, the Flexman brothers and their effect upon, you mentioned in your speech about the change in American medicine. American education, but that was a report that came out in 1910. Yeah, right, right. And also, the Flexner report, the Flexner report uh, how it uh, was, I guess, education and medicine was codified under a Rockefeller grant. Right. I see the Rockefeller popping up like a little boy under a rock. <laughs> but you know, it always the, seems to work to their advantage. The other guy I was going to throw in there, too, who uh, was quite a big guy in behaviorism, uh, is John Dewey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Background. Well, John Dewey is simply in the, in the line. You first had, you had, uh, you began with the Owenites and the Unitarians, then you had Horace Mann was the first biggie, and then after that you had uh, Harris, William Torrey Harris, who was a Hegelian philosopher. He was your second big man in American education. Then you had John Dewey. And Dewey was simply in the same tradition. He was just the latest addition of that whole liberal philosophy. You know, they never learned from their mistakes. There's one thing about them, I, I think that even if, you know, if God walked in front of them, they wouldn't believe it. What's that, yeah. what's that classic story they tell about the educator on the lion that's loose? Uh, I can't remember, I wish I had it on the top of my head, but the educator gets down out of the tree and goes, let the lion eat you. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah. But, uh, he won't believe the lion is <laughs> But if you, but the, there's no end to how ridiculous it can get. You know, we always think that, well, there's a limit. But there really isn't. It'll go as, right, it'll go as, you name it, they can do it. <laughs> they will do it. South Boston High School. Tell us more about South Boston. How is it? Well, it's, in five years, I think they've pulled off a miracle, a near miracle. Uh, the school has, uh, what happened was they, at first, the school had, uh, uh, had quarters in a, rented uh, quarters in a, in a medical center type building with a professional building and then a, uh, an old public school was put up, up put up for sale by the city but, but the school was but the, the, the academy was not permitted to bid for it directly because Garrity wanted to make sure that you know that no uh, no one else might benefit from it so it was sold to a private company that then sold it to the uh, to the academy at a, at about a thousand percent markup. All, all politicians are medical 
Yeah. The original, I think they paid 4000 for it, and the school paid 60000 oh. You're going to have an opportunity. There's 10 more schools going to be available, I understand. <laughs> yeah. But the school, that, so the school has, has done nicely. The, the youngsters wear ties. We have a dress code. We have a discipline code. The curriculum is, is pretty full, pretty strict. There's no, no waste. There are no so-called study periods, you know, where kids sit around auditoriums and throw spitballs at one another. Uh, and on the whole, it's a, a very well-run school. We have a good uh, group of teachers. And uh, the, the main problems, though, however, have been, of course, increased costs. We have to keep our tuition as low as possible because South Boston is not exactly, it's not Brookline, it's not Belmont, it's not Lincoln, you know. so. Uh, we have a different constituency, and we're competing with the, with the parochial schools as well. But uh, uh, so it, it's also a learning experience. You know, we're all learning. You see, the people who run the school, the board of directors, the teachers, we're all learning how to run a private school. And it can be done, and it's a, it's a wonderful thing to be able to attend a board of directors meeting of local citizens running their own schools, uh, uh, del uh, working on their own problems of raising money or whatever has to be done and it's marvelous you don't have to go to the city you don't have to go to the state you don't have to go to the HEW the school has never taken a penny from any governmental source of any kind doesn't want any money from any government doesn't want its affairs interfered with at all you what we, ha we get some, but we ha well, but the school has not made much of an effort. I'd say in the vicinity of four to five thousand dollars a year. All right, four to five thousand dollars in that vicinity between, you know, donations and contributions and tax deductibles. Yes, yes. yes, and your contribution will be greatly welcome at this time because the school is going through a rather tough period of the, the cost squeeze. Uh, we've had a uh, a very rough period, and we're trying to. Uh, uh, use some uh, various fundraising uh, techniques like, uh, shall I mention our, our get, we have Las Vegas nights once a month and a, and a blackjack night <laughs> once a week. Yeah, and that, and that uh, pay, you know, well, South is, is a big bingo and bingo area, but bingo is much too complex, much too complicated. Vegas was advised to us by the you have to be in uh, in operation for five years before you're eligible for a Bino license. And we became eligible December 19th, and we went up and registered to get our license. And we got the license, and when we were given it, we met the office there and advised us. He said, the place is saturated with Binos. He said, I would advise you going into Las Vegas, because we sanction Las Vegas nights too. He said, you have less restriction. You pay the same 5% to the state as you do on Vino, and you can do pretty well uh, what you want. You're restricted on prizes with uh, Vino, whereas with Las Vegas you're not. Uh, with the, uh, Vino you cannot have any kind of uh, liquid beverage uh, outside of coffee. Uh, with Las Vegas you can. Uh, you're not allowed to pay anybody at, uh, at Vino, and I think at Vegas you're allowed uh, three or four that you can pay. Uh, it's just so much less restricted and the uh, fundraising, the raise are a lot higher with the uh, Vegas than it is with the uh, Reno. So we went Vegas. It, it's really, we just have run since we had it too. Sure. And we have black jacket schooling right now. Well, those are the other things I'd like to Anybody wants to tell us? One question. How is the college admission record development? Very good. Very good. We and have here at the South Boston High School. Well, let me tell you, we had, there was an essay contest yeah. held in, uh, in, where was it? South it was Citywide or, or just South? Evacuation Day. Evacuation Day. St. Patrick's Day. And out of the six winners, four came from the academy. So you see that our standards are high because we're in the business of teaching. We're not doing anything else, you see. Well, the interesting about the NEA is that that was the very first organization that goes back to Horace Mann's time, you see, and it was started by that very zealous, that zealous group of, of uh, people who were trying to put 
get public education going in this country, and it's always uh, reflected their views of being national, and they've always wanted a national cabinet seat from the very beginning, and they keep working for that. They're dedicated to that, and, and it doesn't surprise me that they are the most radical of the group, because uh, the group that started them was just as radical. So I, I have, you know, I, all I can say is that uh, what you get is what you see. Oh, what you see is what you get. Well, what I mean is that when you have many others and very effective travel, yeah. at least they say they are, the election people of Congress. Well, sure, they put their money in us. So from the standpoint of uh, trying to change the Congress, it's obvious that uh, this influence is going to have to be counteracted oh, yeah. somehow by whatever influences there are in the country, but the NEA is dedicated to oh, absolutely. keeping those people in office. Yeah. There's no question about the teachers have the strongest <coughs> lobbies in Washington and in state legislatures, and they they are very wary of what's being done that may harm them. I mean, the very fact that they're going after <coughs> the citizens for limited taxation shows up. They are virtually, they are political, let's put it that way. 